<clears throat> and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the, who are called according to His name. All right, let's sing one more song, and then we get started. Are we three o three? Go ahead. Mm-hmm. So last uh, Thursday, uh, we were going through the first part of this chapter. Actually, we were still back uh, in chapter 6, okay? And um, I think the great takeaway from that is that we are free from sin. And um, that means that there is such a condition that you are not free from sin. Um, And we are only free from sin because we are in Christ. So this is a huge deal. There's other things that are part of Romans that are a huge deal uh, when it comes to Christ. But now we are also discussing the fact that we are free from sin. And that literally means that uh, you don't have to sin. You don't uh, have have to sin. Now, when you do sin, um, 
you obviously hurting yourself and you are becoming with which we will read here you becoming a person under bondage and uh, because the more you serve uh, somebody the more you submit yourself the more you yield to somebody then the more you become a servant of that right uh, but you don't have to do that and uh, and i realize that we struggle with certain temptations are very appealing and we have um, you know we all came from something and uh, it's not really pretty. I don't even want to know uh, all your secret sins. Uh, keep it for yourself. Uh, leave it between you and the Lord. Uh, did you know that people actually believe, but this is what Catholics believe, that in order for you to be freed from sin, you have to confess it to other people. And they, they get it from this idea, if you confess the sins, your sins one to another, then you will be healed. All right? So they, they came up with the idea of confession. But uh, that, that's a, such a misunderstanding, and it's so silly, it doesn't work like that. Uh, basically what that scripture says, when it comes to confession of your sins to others, it basically says, here is the, here is the thing, if you uh, say something stupid to somebody there, right, then uh, you, you hurt that person, you sin against the person. And uh, now there is a division. And the Bible says that when you have divisions, then you shouldn't come to the Lord's table. Go fix it and then come and, you know. And the reason there is diseases and problems among you is because of these unresolved issues. So when you uh, sin against another, you should go and confess to the person. You know, in other words, sorry, I screwed up. I shouldn't have said that. And fix it and heal. Right? That's it. That's all this means, you know. And you, do you know that you will really heal? It really it works like that, right? So you have to bring it to the open. You have to be humble about it. And you have to apologize and, and make it up a little bit, you know. And, and then, you know what? The, the whole problem is gone. And uh, surprisingly very quickly, actually. It, it, it's amazing how... And these kind of things have also effect on our literal health. You know, uh, you guys are in medical field, right? Uh, so, so, you, so you, you, sometimes skin problems are related to uh, unresolved uh, uh, problems with relationships. Uh, uh, also, uh, what is it called when you have uh, cram cramps in a in a stomach? And what is it called? Digestive issues. Digestive issues and a few other things, and and maybe a few other uh, emotional and uh, psychological uh, behavior can be really screwed up. Uh, so, so that's not uh, that's not what we are supposed to live in. Hence, confess the sins one to another, and don't allow this uh, bitterness to grow, and uh, and uh, then infect also other people. Because if two people are not talking for too long, then you're gonna start looking for allies, you know, slightly. It's just becoming a huge mess and can destroy the place, the church. That's all it means. Confess one sins one to another. Not this idea that you should ventilate all your secret sins to to somebody else, to some priest or whatever, and then he's gonna know all your secrets. Now he may be tempted with your sin. On top of that, it's like you know, like it's a nonsense, right? You don't have to necessarily confess it to other. And I've I've learned a little bit the hard way myself, you know. So that's that's uh, really uh, when it comes to uh, difficult things and difficult sins. I mean, sometimes. Having said that, sometimes it, it, it's not wrong, obviously, to go to someone uh, that you that is reputable and responsible to maybe ask for advice. Okay, and you may have to come up uh, come out with it. I say this. It's uh, I'm sorry. I hope you will keep it for yourself and be discreet about it. But I'm really trying to deal with this issue. What can you talk? What can we talk about it? You know. Uh, and uh, and uh, what can you help me to advise? And sometimes you may, nowadays in the era of internet, you may find a lot of junk there, but you may also find testimonies of people that have gone through some difficult things, and um, they are telling you, this is what I went through, and this is how I got out of it. So that can be a blessing. Right? So that said, uh, I realize that we all deal with temptations and difficult uh, uh, rooted uh, behavioral pattern, then we may be carried from a, a sort of a previous life. And uh, it's important to acknowledge it. Let's be merciful with each other. Uh, sometimes uh, the idea is now you're saved and now you have to be perfect. That is nonsense. Uh, just like with a child, you're expecting uh, to start walking uh, and it's going to be certain progress. And in the meantime, there's going to be a lot of falls. Right? And you don't want to make the child f guilty. My goodness, you know, you fell again. 
you know they, they, now you're the problem you know what, what the heck right and so so there is definitely certain expectation um, adequate to the maturity of the of the person but there is also a certain expectation okay it's not gonna be completely perfect hence let's move on okay it's important to just get up and keep going and try again um, so uh, while we read this you, you know we have to understand all the scriptures this is kind of one perspective and this perspective tells us that uh, you were you are free from sin and the Bible tells us that in uh, verse 7 for he that is dead is freed from sin so we're talking about dead and uh, how are we dead we talked about baptism last time remember baptizo the, the, the Greek word Baptizo means that you're immersed in Christ. That means you're soaked. You're fully in Him. When a person is baptized in the water, that's really just a public testimony of what you're doing. And it's important that we do that. But really, baptism, the kind of baptism that actually saves you, is that you are you, you become uh, Christ. You, you're born again. You're baptized by the Holy Spirit. And you are in Him. And then you maybe physically go and do it and demonstrate publicly. But the Bible tells us that by baptism we are saved. And then people say, oh, you see, you have to be baptized in the water. Oh, you're not saved. No, 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 no. <laughs> That's not, not that kind of baptism. So when we're talking about you're baptized in the Lord Jesus, you are uh, immersed. Another idea is that you are pruned to Christ. So you, when you think about it, you take a branch that's from a different tree and, pr and prune it to another tree, then uh, it is literally, it gets everything from that trunk from that tree. So it's it. Even though it's come from a different foreign tree, now it's part of it. And it produces um, the things that come from the sap, that come from the tree. And so that's the idea of baptism, that when you are baptized, you are literally one with Christ. And when you are one with Christ, that means that everything that belongs to Christ belongs to you. And everything that Christ is, is you. So for example, Christ, we know he died. Well, that means you died. You know that Christ is risen again. That means you are risen again. You know that Christ is in His glory. Then you are glorified. That means that Christ inherits everything because He conquered the devil and everything. That means you inherit everything. You know? so, so it's a pretty cool deal. And I made that point before many times. That with Christ you have everything. Without Christ you have nothing. Uh, and uh, so that's very important we understand. So if we go now to the second part of the chapter uh, 6, uh, we will pick it up at uh, verse 14. For sin shall have no dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. All right? So there you go. I mean, the Bible clearly tells us that if you are dead in Christ, that means that you are born again, you are baptized uh, into Christ, and if you're baptized into Christ, you're baptized to everything, the Father, the Holy Ghost, and the Christ. When you are baptized in Christ, th that's true about you. So you're dead to sin, and that means that you are not no longer under the dominion of the sin. In other words, uh, before that you are under the dominion of sin. You are under the dominion of death also. But you're dead. You're already dead. So the death has no longer dominion over you. Sin has no longer dominion over you. And we obviously deal with the reality of death or potentially, well, we are dealing with the reality of death, period. We are all going to die. And maybe sooner, maybe later, but we are subject to that in this body. But in some, and, and when you are dead in the body, essentially, that's in some ways freeing, you know, because you, you leave everything behind. Um, and uh, so all these obligations, let's say there is a debt, you know, that you racked up, you know, uh, well, that's gone. You, you're dead and there's no way to get it from you, you know. So uh, you are in some ways free. But if you don't have Christ, then it's kind of weird freedom because then you, you still face God with uh, the, the, your, your sins and everything. So, so you're not really free. Uh, but here's how it works with the law, of course, and this is obviously not that uh, shocking. The fact is that when uh, there is a contract between two, two parties, uh, there are certain contracts that finish with, uh, with death. And most notably, we know, we know that marriage works like that, right? So marriage, we're not Mormons. Mormons believe in a marriage forever, right? Uh, we believe that till death do us apart. Hence, you should not 
make it shorter by divorcing and you should not make it longer by Mormon style, you know? It's till death do us apart. In other words, this contract ends with uh, the death of uh, one of the spouses. And uh, a good example of that is, of course, uh, David uh, is this lady, but um, Abigail, right? Abigail was married to this, who knows his name? Uh, Nabal. Nabal, yeah. She was married to Nabal, this, uh, this guy that didn't have much... Uh, appetite for David and uh, and we know that David was about to go and kind of punish him for um, for being rude to him and, and nasty not not helping him when he helped them all along and uh, believing the, the the lies that came from the palace how David was a bad dude or whatever right and uh, Nabal uh, almost uh, destroyed his own household and then we know that Abigail because he was drunk he, she actually took uh, the things in her own hand and she met David and bowed her before him bring him brought him some food and basically asked him to to spare them and provide for them and David was thankful to her it's good that he came because I was about to do something terrible and we know what happens when she comes home her husband is drunk so she's not dealing with him but the next morning where he sobered up a little bit, she comes and tells him, hey, by the way, you should know that I actually went to David last night and I brought him all the food uh, that you first rejected. And when he heard that, remember, he got a stroke and uh, a brain stroke. So, so he, he basically lost, uh, either, either he lost conscience or he, maybe he, he probably have lost conscience. Yeah, he, he, he basically was a vegetable for the next 10 days. And then for the 10 days, uh, she is stuck with her husband and she cannot leave, right? And she doesn't leave. She cannot leave. Why? Because of the law. And the law is broken when, she, when somebody dies. Now, there is two people that can die here, either Nabal or she dies, right? But until there is a death, she has no right to leave. And we live in a society where this is not understood because you have a no for divorce. You know, that's nonsense. This is such a travesty that the government allows. Uh, you know, I married uh, Danny and, and Rebecca, and uh, they tell you there's, there's a whole document you have to study in order to do everything properly. You know, so there's so much rules, you know. So you, it would make you think that it's very important to them. But then if you want to divorce it, it's a lot easier to divorce it than to make them married. You know, it's weird. Nonsense. Uh, so it's a terrible disservice to the public. Um, so we don't like that though, right? People don't like that. The fact that there's, there's no, uh, people love the idea of no-fault divorce. You know, if you just get tired of it, I, mean, I, just, uh, I can just get out of it. Well, that's not right. You are stuck in the law. You are under the law. And uh, this is a good example of that. There's other examples of the law and we read it in chapter 7. And the law is, the more I try to do good, the, the, I, I just can't help it. It's the law. You know, it's, it's like a gravity. You can think of uh, and desire, I wish I could fly. No matter how, well, how much you try, you always fall down. And the higher you go, the, f the, the harder the fall is going to be. So it's a law. You can't escape it. And uh, we were talking about different laws, you know, uh, the, how, we are, how we are going to be free from that. You know, uh, free from gravity, free on entropy and a few of other things. Uh, you are subject to aging, you're subject to dying, you're subject to uh, all sorts of uh, things. You're subject to taxes, you know, you're subject to stupidity out there. You're subject to so many different things uh, that wouldn't be wonderful if we can be free from it, right? But you can be, not in this world. But the Bible tells us here that we uh, are no longer under dominion of the sin. And we are not under the dominion of the law. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. That means that, um, you know, I was explaining to once, if you're driving on a highway and you get a ticket, it's almost like the ticket uh, it has no power. Yeah, so we have a speeding, but uh, I'm free from the law. It really means that. And people don't like that because they would like to keep you kind of hooked. But it really does mean that, that even if you do sin, we confess our sins and our Father in heaven is faithful and just who forgives all our sins. We're free. We're free from, we, we are of the hook in that way. Why? Well, because we are baptized in Christ and we're dead. 
we're dead. And if we, because we are dead, it's like Nabal is dead and the, the marriage is over. And you know what she did uh, the day he died? What did she do when he died? She married. You know, she married David literally right away, right? And she became, I think, his second wife. So that's another story. But um, not everything is perfect in the Old Testament, is it? So let's uh, read in verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law and under the grace? So Bible takes it as a granted, right? We are not under the sin and we're not under the law. So that's a fact. Now, that's actually a pretty good uh, question, right? Because I just gave you an example with a speeding ticket. Hey, I cannot get a ticket, so I can speed as much as I I know we all would do that, right? You know, if you could speed anyone you own, I'd be speeding, you know? I can't get a ticket. People would see me, oh man, that's a guy on, that's not under the law, you know, right? He'd be jealous. And uh, so the Bible tells us, God forbid. No, 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 don't think like that. That's not a good uh, way of thinking. So how come? I'm free now, right? And, and here is the thing, how people understand freedom. Freedom is to do what you want. To basically, people think of freedom as basically letting your flesh to do what it wants. Uh, this is completely devilish. Uh, who was it? What was this? The Beast of 666, what's his name? Was um, on the yellow, yellow submarine of Beatles. There's this guy, what was his name? He wrote, uh, yeah, he's one of the Beatles, but uh, Alistair Crowley, yeah, oh. Alistair Crowley, right? So he said, he, he wrote the Satanic Bible, right, 1969, I think, you know, in California. Uh, he says, do what thou will shall be the whole law, right? And there's other things he said that are on the same, on the same wave. So the idea of uh, freedom, and I think uh, when people talk about libertarians, you know, you, you know libertarians? You know, there's a political movement that's a libertarian. These people basically have the idea that libertarianism is that you just, anybody do what I want. It's more like anarchism, really. And I don't believe in libertarian movement. You know, like Ron Paul in the U.S., that would be libertarian. And uh, it's just, it's just uh, it, that's a little different understanding, the way I understand freedom. Freedom is that you are, I think when it comes to sin, one way to see it, when it comes to liberty f from sin, could be, hey, I can do now whatever I want, all right? Not, not like that. That's not right. The freedom is you don't have to sin anymore. See, that's the freedom, right? That's the true liberty. And we just read it. You're no longer under dominion, meaning you don't have to sin. It's not like you are free to just let your flesh go. I mean, really? Is that what Jesus died for? So you can just live like a devil, you know, and not be accountable for it? That's not the point of that, right? So you're free. In other words, you don't have to do that anymore. And people that, let's say, have been on drugs and are terribly addicted to that terrible habit, right? Uh, they are free to take drugs. But they will tell you if they get out of it, if they don't die in between, they'll tell you, uh, they will admit, I was in bondage. And uh, what do they call when they get off the hook, right? They say, I'm being free from drugs. So you, you do know that. You know that the freedom is actually being uh, not under the dominion of your flesh, right? And that's really the point. That's really the key. So let's understand liberty and freedom proper properly. Um, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? Verse 16 now. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. So there you have it. Uh, who you serve, him as his servant or her servant or its servant, you become. And uh, there's something that hit me, uh, by, by, unfortunately, by too much of experience as opposed to just learning it from others. And that is that uh, if you have a certain weakness in your flesh and you, you just do not restrict the flesh, you just always give it what it wants, then it... It, it's like a, it's like the flesh gets bigger. It's like the 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 power of it becomes bigger. So next time it's gonna be harder to say no, you know, because you just fed it. You know, it's it, it, imagine like 
if you give it, it's almost like you give it a sugar. And when you give it a sugar, it just gets slightly bigger. And next time it's going to be almost like a Goliath. And you know what happens when there is a Goliath? Nobody wants to fight it, right? Because it's just too big now. And uh, it becomes very difficult to battle to kind of turn back and say, no, 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 from now on, I'm not going to do that. And, and it's, it's going to be a little bit harder um, because now you're dealing with a big issue. When, if you manage it while it's still small, it becomes a lot more manageable. So we should not underestimate the power of the flesh. And so the Bible tells us here that if you become, a, if you obey something, someone or whatever, or that little passion that you have, if you just obey it, if you always give it what it wants with no restriction, well, then don't be surprised that it's going to be strong in your life. You know, you're going to be a little bit under that uh, uh, bondage. But be, uh, God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Being then made free from sin, there we have it again. Yeah. So now considering that, assuming, uh, uh, appreciating the fact that we are free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. So now it's a matter of whose servants we become. Now I suspect, I don't have it here, but maybe some of the Bibles... They will have instead, there's a lot of servant word here, right? Maybe some of the Bibles turn the servant to slave. You know, that would be Calvinistic idea. And so uh, think about how nonsense it is. You know, if you are free, how could you be a slave? You see, slave means that you can't help but to do good. You know, that would be proper slavery. And I don't have it because I, I know, I, I'm more like, uh, more like what we write in chapter 7. I would like to, but, you know, there's something in me that fights me. And uh, we were talking about John Wesley, the error of John Wesley. The idea of John Wesley is that if you properly die, which implies that you're not dead, even though you're a Christian, you're not quite dead. And I reject it wholeheartedly. But he preached this idea that uh, you have to, through uh, f proper things, through preaching, through, through come to the church and through fasting and praying and doing everything right, then when you completely die, when you completely die, then, then you're free, finally. So he had this idea, unbiblical idea, the Methodist idea, is that you become free somewhere la later on but after you become saved. That's false. And that's more aligned with Pentecostalism than anything else. No wonder Pentecostalism comes from Methodism. But uh, another Calvinistic idea is that you become slave. So you are, and, and they, oddly enough, they teach very similar things, right? Except uh, Methodists, they call it holiness. In uh, uh, Calvinism, they call it lordship. But it really is the same idea in your life to somehow uh, reach to a certain level where you are finally, you know, John Piper, right? He calls it the, the final... The, the essential for final salvation. What the heck is that? He says, for, essentially for the final salvation is killing of sin. You know, but that's that's not true. We are baptized in Christ now. And as long as you are Christ, you're baptized now. Well, then I'm all like, how come I still struggle with that? Well, hello, we read chapter 7. The Apostle Paul says that. And this is a converted person. I think we don't argue with that, right? And he has that issue. So be uh, ready and accept it that, yeah, as a Christian, you will be struggling with uh, your sinful nature all the way to the end. And what is a great uh, consolation to us is that we are free from it. All right? We are free from it. In other words, we are no longer made accountable before God because guess what? The blood of Christ cleanses everything. It's all covered. Amen. Say it too. I mind, right? It's not the end yet. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, being then m made free from sin, he became the servants of righteousness. So I was mentioning slave. Now we're not slave righteousness because slavery would imply that you have no choice but do that. But that's that's not where we are. We are servants. All right. Um, I speak after the manner of man because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and to iniquity and to iniquity, even so now yield your members' servants to righteousness unto holiness. Now, I don't know how anybody can understand this, except this is something you voluntarily have to do. Right? You have to, 
yourself a yield to righteousness. And if it's a yield, then that means you are in some ways the master here, right? You know, you decide whether you're going to yield. And if you don't yield, then you don't have to yield, but then you probably yield to something else. So, so, so we have that choice, I guess, yielding, yielding to evil and sin or yielding to righteousness. But it's something that we do, and that's not always an easy battle. This idea that we can just be delivered. You know, somebody will pray over me and I'll be devil delivered from the curse of cussing. Delivered from the kiss of um, anger. Or delivered from uh, pornography, delivered from alcoholism and stuff like that. Maybe sometimes there's something that can be done. I remember at least two or three occasions I heard somebody had a very uh, breaking point and everything changed after that. Right, so that, that that's supposedly I, I, I suppose can happen. Um, I have a friend of mine. He was struggling, struggling with smoking, and then he was saying this weird dream he had at night. He was sweating, couldn't sleep. He was this this little devil was dancing on his arms, on his shoulders or something. And um, the next day he he that was he never smoked again. Oh. Right. So those are cute stories, you know. That sometimes that can happen. And praise God if that uh, God did something for you like that. But it, it also is true that sometimes it is a little bit of a more, um, more tough journey. All right? It's a matter of learning. And yielding is, is a process. And here is another thing. Christian virtue is to yield. Christian virtue is to yield. Yield is none of us want to do. Eh? We have a rebellious spirit. We don't want to yield. You know, talking about fixing a relationship with somebody. Why is it that you don't want to do that? Because it requires you to yield, right? It requires to embarrass yourself. It's to admit, it's to accept uh, guilt. You know, it's none of those things we like to do. So that's a yield. And uh, there is no Christianity, really maturing Christianity, without yielding. That's uh, we humble ourselves. You know, the Bible says, "Humble thyself in the sight of the God, uh, of the Lord, and He shall lift you up." Also, the Bible says, that "God opposes the proud, uh, but He favors the humble." Right. So, total humility is absolutely necessary for any kind of growth, and here we have it too. You want to grow? You want to? You want to uh, submit? You, you want to be a person that follows the righteousness, that which which actually belongs to us. This is our status. Our status that we are just and righteous. Our status that we are dead to sin and we are alive to Christ. Right? That's our status. But when it comes to our flesh, our flesh is fighting against it. And so we need to yield. Because that's our new nature now. And uh, so uh, if you are frustrated with it, then uh, don't be too desperate. Uh, but pray about it and God will do something somehow. Maybe write down the progress. You'll be surprised. You may be just frustrated with yourself because you always see only the pile of work out of you. Uh, but maybe if you actually look back and say, hey, actually, I don't... There is a change in my life here. I used to struggle with this and it's not as bad because the Holy Spirit works with you and, 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 and does that, okay? Uh, for when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. All right, so this is another thing. Uh, you will recognize that this works like that. I don't know what about you, but uh, I was, um, un until I was 15, I was lost. So I got saved when I was 15. Um, so before that, for me, it's true that until I was 15, uh, I was the servant of sin. See, now I am no longer under the dominion of sin, but before that I was. And here is what it, what it does. A person that is free from uh, righteousness, in other words, he is, uh, in some ways, free to sin, right? Um, it's true that it doesn't bother you as much as to sin. And it, it depends what, what you're talking about. Let's say fornication. I think that a lot of people don't have a problem to fornicate. I, I, I would be terribly stricken if I committed adultery, right? I would be, I'd be, I, I, I don't know, it would be terrible. Uh, I just can't do it, right? You know? Uh, and if I ever do it, then, uh, you know, that will be terrible. So uh, this is uh, 
this is uh, what uh, the lost world they have okay they don't have really there's a little bit of uh, conscience so they they know especially if it's something repeated there is a sen sentiment of guilt so you know you're not supposed to do something and if you do it then you feel kind of bad but they feel a little bit like a dog even dog can feel like a guilty yeah, they're not guilty but you know he goes like that and and it's more like a sucks i got caught right then, then through, uh, through, through sensation of, uh, okay, I, I really messed up. Mm. So when a person is lost, it's more like a dog. It's just, okay, kind of a little bit guilt, but on the other hand, whatever, you know. You know, it's not as bad. When a person gets saved, this is like uh, driving a car with a messed up, um, messed up engine. And all your little indicators are not functioning. So it's a nice ride. Uh, and then somebody fixes for you and now boo, all these blinkers start going on. What, what the heck, you know? That's what our life is like a little bit, you know? It's like all these indicators, that's not right, that's not right, that's not right, you know? It's like, man, all right? Uh, so it almost felt better before. Yeah, but now it's better. So, so that renewed sensation of uh, understanding what is holy and what is, what is not just is good for us. But when we know it, it's not fun to, to, to face it. Let's uh, face it. <laughs> um, so here you go. When you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. Yeah, that's true. And I've heard a lot of people, the, the other day I heard somebody that said, I got saved and I immediately knew that abortion is wrong. And before that, I had no problem with it. Immediately. Now they find it amazing, right? Because uh, you're no longer servant of sin. You're now servant of, of righteousness. And because you're servant of righteousness, then you're running to this terrible um, dilemma or ter this, this terrible um, uh, struggle in your heart. Man, now that I am alive and I understand uh, the evil sin, I actually see much better. Uh, you know, all these little indicators are going on and on. And he talks about it in chapter 7. You know, what wretched am I am? You know, I try and then I can't. And uh, I completely agree with it, but I something fights against me. So uh, that obviously um, is painful, but it's a better place to be. And the answer to, to that is not to kill the switch, to kill the indicators. That's not the answer. The answer is also not to kind of, ah, whatever, disregard it. That's not the answer to that, too. What is the answer? What, do you, what would you say is the answer to that? The answer to that, uh, you see, before, before you were saved, you were free from uh, guilt and that sort of thing, right? Well, now you're not. Now the conscience is there and it bothers you. And you don't like it. So what do you do with that? Well, you can try to not do it anymore so that all the lights go off. So that would be nice, you yeah? know? Except, uh, uh, you know, the one, one stops and the other one goes on. And it's like all over the place, right? So that seems a little bit frustrating. You can just disregard it. Some people do that. Don't worry about it, right? Just, just you know, you, that's basically what he said, you know. What then? Shall we sin because we are under the law? So that's basically people are suggesting, well, why do we even bother about these lights? Well, it's just a fact. We're sinners, so let's just be happy that we go to heaven. Is that, God says, God forbid. So that's not the answer. So what's the answer to these lights, to, to, this, uh, to this mess on the dashboard of your life? You know, what, what's the answer to that? You can't quite fix it. It's not right to disregard it. What do you do with that? The answer is the, in the end of chapter 7. I thank God. I mean, that basically 24 expresses that. Oh, wretched man that I am. Yeah. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from the body of his death? And the answer to that is this. I thank God that through Jesus Christ our Lord, so that with mine I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. And that's an that's a iffy thing for some people, that um, uh, we have to accept the fact that our, our flesh, your flesh, is sanctified, you're sanctified, and it suddenly belongs to God because He paid for it, but your flesh 
his destiny, its destiny is in the in the ground. We're gonna have to let it go. And so in the meantime, we kind of take it with us, and we are a little bit patient with ourselves, and understand that. Thank God. Okay, I I am free. I am a, a new man, but with my flesh, I serve the, the the law. But yet I am not under dominion. I am no longer responsible. And then, of course, in chapter eight, it actually explains that you are indeed free from um, from the, the, the you know you are free, you know, because you are living uh, according to spirit. Will it, Leave that for another time. So verse 21, still chapter 6. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. Right? So the point is, what was it? So, okay, so you could do whatever you want. The dashboard was off. It didn't bother you. You could just do whatever you But what was the advantage? You know, what was the benefit of that? Well, nothing. You were just, you were dead. And you were condemned. But now being made free from sin and become... Servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is dead, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So you have the two dilemmas, two options, two ideas, uh, two versions or two, two paths. Either a person is under sin, then you get your wage, or you are free from sin and you, are, you don't get the wage, which is a bad thing. But you are under grace of God and you get gift. And the gift is, of course, um, eternal life and uh, justification and righteousness. So what's the takeaway from this? What's the takeaway from uh, uh, this chapter 6 and partially chapter 7? So we learn that uh, we are no longer under uh, the, the dominion of sin. Yet at the same time we acknowledge that it is a battle. <laughs> Uh, I wish I could stand here and say, brothers and sisters, we are free. And if you just come here and I'll lay hands on you, you fall backward, you're going to be free and you're not going to have a tendency to sin. Well, that would be a lie. And uh, it's nonsense. It doesn't work like that. And so maybe that somebody would say, well, that's a little discouragement. Now, the encouragement, the hope, the good news here is not that you're not going to struggle in the flesh. No, 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 no. The good news is that you are not going to be made accountable in the end for the weaknesses and flaws in your flesh. And in the meantime, while in this flesh, we are basically encouraged and asked to not yield to the sin, but yield yourself to righteousness. And yielding will require some sweating and require some pain. Because yield is not fun. And so um, people can be creative. Um, uh, you, you can sometimes people make teams and become accountable to one another uh, for the purpose of encourage one another to do better and to, to, to encourage one another to, to yield indeed themselves to the uh, law of righteousness. In some ways, every church should be doing that just by getting together, dealing with things, <laughs> And uh, encouraging one another, hey, don't, uh, you know, it's like David, right? David uh, is, is walking around, and uh, David the king, and he's looking around, and he says, you know, like, I looked around, and I see a wicked man, uh, you know, prospering. And almost, I almost thought, uh, the thought that maybe I can live like that too, until I came to the uh, house of God, and then, then, I realized, and I realized, oh my goodness, what a fool would I to even start thinking like that because then I understood what is their end. See, that's the purpose of so coming to the church and to be in a company of other like-minded believers because they can kind of keep your feet to the fire a little bit, right? And uh, give you a little bit of feedback and encourage you uh, really to, to pursue holiness, to pursue uh, living. Uh, and if you screwed up, well, then don't crucify yourself. Crucify somebody already was. You don't have to necessarily condemn yourself, but uh, but at the same time, you know, don't don't pat yourself over the shoulder like some kind of hero. Like uh, admit it that you are weak, and uh, God receives those that are weak, and let's just start do it again. Amen. So I think that's really the hope, and that's what makes church church. 
because we are living under grace. And also we treat one another with that idea. You know, sometimes you can have that. You have uh, people that maybe never struggle with certain things. Somebody grows up in a, in a solid home or a Christian church. And uh, here you have uh, some new newcomer and he's bringing with his all this baggage and all that stuff. It's very tempting to look down on, on that person. Yeah. And uh, when you, whenever you catch yourself thinking like that, you, you like go outside and kick yourself in the butt. I mean, as you're, you are, you're no, no better than, than the person. Uh, Jesus wouldn't have to die less for you if, if you were the only one, but because of this guy, he had to die literally a lot. That is obviously stupidity. Uh, hence, uh, we are all uh, under the condemnation of the law, and we need to treat each other with certain, uh, you know, break and be tolerant of another. Just realize, okay, here's a, here's a person that struggles. Now, obviously, if certain sin gets a little bit out of whack, then we have to deal with it. You know, I'm sorry you cannot be with us. But it's not because you're worse than me. It's just your sin is a little bit out of control now. And if you don't, if you don't control it, then you, other people think that this is okay. So please don't come to the church anymore until you fix this particular thing. And there's only limited uh, number of things that we should apply this to. For example, if somebody is in adultery or fornication, you know, okay, that's a no-no. If you want to keep coming to the church, you have to deal. You have to stop it now. And if you don't stop it next Wednesday, then don't come. But please stop it, you know. Another thing, if somebody is turning church into a marketing place, yeah? You know, try to solicit people for business. Is it opportunity? No, not, not for that purpose. And, uh, uh, or if somebody um, is idolatry, or is bring, bring, you know, certain things. Uh, the Bible has a list of, I think it's about seven, of things. Uh, often this is mispracticed. You know, people are kicked out because they don't have a right bonnet right, in the Amish circles. People are kicked out because somebody follows this, this preacher. You know, like I was kicked out of a church because I had a positive word and it was not really even that positive. It was just not negative. I had to be negative in order to be okay to be there. It's like shame. So that's, uh, that's wrong. Um, so obviously we practice the church discipline. But when we do practice the church discipline, we still do it in a spirit of humility because... Uh, you know, we are also fault, right? And so grace, grace really is the answer. The answer is, I thank God. It's a gift of God. And the only thing you can do is not to pay for anything. You can only, you know, he's asking, who, sh who shall deliver me from uh, the body of this death? I thank God. God does it through Jesus Christ. So then we accept the fact, okay, I myself serve the law of God, but if it's flesh, the law of sin but I'm dead to sin. And while I am in this flesh, it's going to be a little bit of a pain, uh, but uh, it's just temporary. Then we are going to dump this body. God is going to give us a new body, and then we're going to be flying. Amen? Amen. All right, let's uh, finish with that. Let's uh, bow our heads in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us such a wonderful answer to our frustration with our own sin. And Lord, uh, Help us to want to live a holy life. Help us to also encourage one another in a spirit of grace, in a spirit of understanding and, uh, uh, and humility to, uh, to, to indeed uh, yield our uh, body to the law of righteousness. And we, Lord, we, you know very well that it's far from perfect, but uh, at least we know that we don't have to be nervous or somehow concerned about our security of our life and of our salvation just because we uh, stumble here and there, even if it's a serious stumble. And yet uh, we, as far as our, our mind, as our soul, we are secure. And Lord, even when it comes to the flesh, help us to be good stewards and to, uh, learn to submit and yield with our flesh to your law and uh, to your to your word i pray in jesus name amen